What's going on guys? We are now live. I'm just going to jump right into this Q&A and start off by saying um, I got a lot of great suggestions for uh, things to talk about in this Q&A, um, including uh, proper warm-up from, shout out to J -J -Duth from or Jacob from Jaduth Basketball. He asked me a uh, proper way to talk about proper ways to warm up before a dunk session. Um, tracking progress uh, was another suggestion I got. And then the last thing I'm going to end with is going to be, it's a little bit of a, like a clickbait just to add in the title, but I'm going to talk about like this this thought I had after going uh, going over th the research for this Q and A. Um, it was just just a random thought, and I'm going to talk about learning how to dunk and kind of the thought I had uh, thought I had about uh, related to that. Um, hey, what's up? Shout out to to Peter in the live chat right now. Um, so yeah, so but the topic of this Q and A is going to be on high velocity training, and I kind of got the interest in talking about this topic because I feel like I've gone through um, a few different phases, I guess you could say, of training, um, including like strength. Uh, I've been doing contrast training, plyometric training, um, just different types of training that that I that I feel like I've gone through. Uh, so I just wanted to to cover something I haven't I haven't really looked at looked into much, and that was high velocity training. Um, and another thing that kind of got me to think about it was, if you guys saw, I'm going to switch to um, the split screen really quick. If you guys have, if you guys have seen on my Instagram, I made this post a while back, but I actually had a vertical jump analysis done at my school in the lab here. And something that I just that I remember when I was thinking about you know looking into this high velocity training was that this line right here. So the, the normal, the two foot jump that had the greatest, um, that, that I jumped the highest after, uh, was had the greatest takeoff velocity. So that, that was just something I wanted to point out in the, um, in the vertical jump analysis that I got done last year. Just to kind of share with you guys and on where I, I also got the idea to look into this high velocity training. Hey, what's up, Mitchell? Um, so yeah, so I want to start off by going over um, just kind of a, a definition of high velocity training and how the, um, let's see here, the American College of Sports Medicine kind of defines it. And they just, they basically just describe high velocity training as, um, in the first line right here, as an individual's ability to move quickly and maximize power output. So that's just basically like a, a quick, uh, a quick summary of what high velocity training entails and what, what the goal of it would be. And then also this last this last line here. Therefore, the resultant movement speed can be increased if training increases or if training exercises are performed very fast with a light load. So I think the key out of that last line is very fast and with a lighter load. So again, that that would be to uh, maximize power output um, in the high vo higher velocity training. So the focus again is speed with a lighter load. And then also there's a the summary at the bottom here um, talked about. Um, it is clear from the research that high velocity, low load training is related to an ability to produce force quickly. So that's um, something that's going to be carried over into the first study that I'm going to talk about is producing force quickly, um, not just producing a, a high amount of force, but actually producing it quickly um, and has implications for activities of daily living as well as athletic endeavors. High velocity exercises results in specific high velocity adaptations. Um, so yeah, so again, uh, just remember that uh, for the first study I'm going to talk about, it talks about, um, kind of goes into producing force quickly and what that means. So to bring up the first study here, uh, the influence of high resistance and high velocity training on sprint per, uh, performance. And even though it's talked about sprint performance, or, um, they did talk, they did, um, talk about vertical jump training because um, a lot of what goes into vertical jump training is similar to, to sprinting. So I'm going to bring up the study really quick here. Okay, so what I wanted to point out was um, in this in the first part of the study uh, was was this first statement that they made talking about what uh, or or what what the point of high velocity training would be and kind of the idea behind uh, behind the point of it. So uh, this first line: the strength of an athlete is not only determined by the size or morphology of his muscles. Um, but also by the ability of the nervous system to appropriately activate these muscles. So basically, basically trying to recruit as many muscle fibers as possible, which um, goes back to that producing force quickly. So to produce force quickly, you want to be able to recruit as many muscle fibers as you can uh, as fast as possible. Um, as it is 
as it is a sprinter's aim to improve his power, the fastest motor units must be activated in the most specific way, and a variety of training methods can be used to enhance dynamic performance. Now, this, this argument um, must be activated in the most specific way. I'm going to kind of counter that argument with a review article at, that I'm going to talk about after this study. And it actually, the review article kind of, not contradicts, but... but um, just kind of brings in a, a, a wider scope of why high velocity training might not necessarily be necessary um, and why it just might be not overcomplicating but why high, why like why putting a label on high velocity training might not might not be like an end all be all to you know increase your vertical or run faster or whatever it might be uh, whatever the training might be used for um, yeah, so that's just what I wanted to point out in this in the first part of this study here. Um, let's see. I'm going to go to the chat really quick and see what people are saying. Uh, Mitchell said, I'm 16. What should I work on to get more explosive? Um, so I mean that would just depend on what you've worked what you've worked on up to this point, Mitchell. If you haven't done any type of um, like strength training, then that would probably be a good place to start to get your strength up, and then start to work on plyometrics or just really just jumping. If you haven't started jumping, um, if you haven't jumped a lot, or if you if um, you know if you're if you're trying to jump higher, then it would just be it would probably be best to just start to work on the technique of jumping and getting better at that uh, first. So I would definitely start start there. But yeah, if you if you want to let me know like where where you are in your training, I can give you better probably give you better advice. Okay, but I'm gonna switch back now to that study we were just talking about. Okay, so that was yeah. So that was the first thing I wanted to point out with this study. Um, so they basically had in this study they had two groups. They had a high resistance group, which uh, worked at set, uh, it says right here seventy percent and one hundred percent of their one rep max, and they wanted to and they wanted to focus on or the subjects to focus on speed while they were doing that tr while they were performing the the exercises. And then they had a high velocity group, which I will point out in this table. So these were the different types of exercises they did. So the high resistance group focused on leg extensions, leg curls, all these exercises you see here for, for in weeks one to three, they did three sets of 10, three sets of 10, and then this is a, so total this was a nine week evaluation with both the high resistance and high velocity group. Um, and with the high velocity group, the argument was that there would be a, a higher stress on speed um, because they were just working with uh, body weight, body weight and movements and plyometrics. Here they kind of point out the exercises they did. They had the star, or they performed standing broad jumps, vertical jumps, um, push-ups, uh, squat throwing, skipping, leg frequency bounding, and hopping. So just a bunch of different plyometric movements uh, for the high high velocity group. And this was a test performed on 78, uh, 78 males, ages eighteen to twenty, uh, eighteen to twenty two. So it was a, a fairly large sample size. Going to go to the chat really quick. Mitchell said, like, um, he's played basketball at school, but a tiny bit of training, like stretching, squats, calf raises. Okay, yeah, so Mitchell, so if you want to, um, you know, start to improve your explosiveness even more, then I would definitely say just to start jumping, start to jump more often, you know, just practice doing like rim touches or touching a high point, the highest point you can get, you know, on the backboard or on the net or whatever, um, whatever the highest point is, and just keep pushing yourself to reach higher and higher from that point. Um, and then from, you know, while you're doing that, you can, you can also be building strength or gaining strength by, you know, doing those squats and calf raises and um, other strength type of exercises, but um, primarily focusing on speed. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be the heaviest weight, but, um, you know, you can also focus on, on how fast you're doing the movement uh, if you don't want to, if you don't want to incorporate heavier, heavier weights right away, or even body weighted movements, which is, which is kind of how I got started. Okay, so I'm going to talk about now the, uh, the results of that study. And that'll be the first. Um, that'll be the, that'll be the end of the first uh, the first study. 
again, the second one was a review that kind of went, that kind of contradicted this or just, again, like made it, gave a broader scope on, on why, you know, these types of trainings, uh, these, these labels of training might not necessarily uh, be like an end all or the only type of training that someone should do. Um, so, okay, so there's another point in this that I wanted to point out really quick before going to, before talking about the conclusion, and that is right here. So other uses, so again, so they had a high velocity group and then a high resistance group, and they also, they pointed out that most of the time, if, if somebody is in a, if somebody is um, in a strength training program or a high resistance program, but they're also working on a, working on speed or jumping or something like that, that there, there's usually... A bridging of the gap um, of the high resistance training with with some type of um, some type of running or where is it either some type of running or jumping or plyometric exercises to kind of bridge the gap between only doing strength exercises compared to only doing um, like running or or jumping exercises. So it's just a way to to I guess apply that strength. Oh yeah, and also so this is another thing I wanted to point out with the studies that there were there were two groups. So they had a group that um, they had a run control group, which um, they called just run, and then they had a passive control group. And the run control group participated in a running workout together with the training group uh, once a week. So that group they did a running workout and then also the training, but then the pass group only did the um, their running and no training. So that's where um, they were talking about how with with high resistance. Um, high resistance programs is usually a bridging of the gap by doing um, by doing a workout that that would be actually developing the skill rather than just doing a um, or rather than just doing a strength training program. Okay, and then lastly, I want to point out the training. Okay, so the effects that they found in this study was that the high resistance training group resulted in a significant enhancement of the 10 rep um, max values of five selected exercises of bench, leg press, um, leg press, half squat, leg extension, and arm curl. The high velocity training group also resulted in a significant improvement of the performances in vertical jump, standing broad jump, hopping, bounding, and backwards throwing. Okay, so that's that's the main point I wanted to point out with the with the effects of this is that the high velocity group um, resulted in a, a higher performance in the vertical jump compared to the high resistance um, the high resistance group in this study. That was just the main result I wanted to point out. And then for the conclusion, I just wanted to go over this last paragraph of the conclusion because it kind of gave a good wrap up of the of the whole of the study as a whole. And what they found. So um, I'm just going to read it here. The the high velocity program did not tend to improve maximum running speed, as stated in the second hypothesis. The relation between high velocity training and initial acceleration can be probably be explained by the fact that in the takeoff phases of jumping exercises, as well as in the initial sprint acceleration phases, the athlete needs to create a maximum acceleration of the whole body mass. So basically, what I what I got from that was that they with the high velocity group, they saw that they saw it to be more applicable to with to sprinting or to jumping exercises because it, it mimicked more of the motion that has to occur before before um, you know the, before the full motion takes place. So before a sprint actually takes place or before beginning a uh, an, an approach to a jump, like the the initial acceleration that has to occur is similar to that with with training high velocity. So. That's uh, the, that's what I wanted to read from the conclusion here, and that's basically what I wanted to talk about with this study. Um, and I want to bring up the review article, but first I'm going to look back at the um, at the chat really quick and see. Hey, what's up? Hello. Mitchell said, "How many times a week do you go to the gym, and is that weights is that weights plyo or dunks? How many times? Okay, so to answer your first question." 
question, Mitchell. I go to the gym probably five times a week, four to five times a week, and I'll do. That's including. Well, if you're in a, if you're including dunk sessions or just going to play basketball once a week, then it's probably more like five to six times. Um, but yeah, so probably like four times a week working out. Three to four, and then dunking, jumping, and then playing basketball maybe one day of those six. And is that weights, plyo, or dunks? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that second question. You said, and is that weights, plyo, or dunks? All right, so with the second article that I want to uh, bring up and talk about, it was actually really interesting that I found the second article because it went, like I said, it, like I've said, it, it it didn't go against what that what that study was was pointing out with high velocity training and how it it benefited or it showed that there were benefits with um, vertical jumping and sprinting, um, but it just brought in a, a, an interesting point that kind of made me. That kind of goes along with my last thought that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to end this Q&A with, and that is um, the learning part of dunking and what uh, what that means. So, with this um, with this review, okay, let me see really quick. Okay, so with this review, they focused on movement velocity and resistance training, and they looked. This was a review that looked at um, studies that tested different velocities ranging from slow to high velocity, and they categorized they categorized them into different groups depending on how fast um, the degrees per second changed in velocity, and they tested it against different uh, different training methods uh, using isokinetic training. Um, hydraulic and pneumatic training. So this is just basically isotonic training, just different. They, they looked at different ways that this velo that velocity can be trained, pretty much. Um, so the first thing I want to point out, so basically in this study, what, like the point, the reason I'm bringing up this study is because of the points that they made in it and why it's, why it couldn't be easy, you know, if you, if you hear one thing in one study, why it can be easy to just kind of take that as, um, as take that as evidence and it being the um, you know, like like the right way to look at it in a sense, I guess. But in this um, in this study, they started off with or not start off, but the point, the first thing I want to bring up in this study was, um, let's see, this paragraph right here. So there, so in this first one with looking at isokinetic equipment with velocity training, um, there seems to be no agreement as to the effects of fast velocity training on gains and strength. For some, this type of training also generated gains in all velocities, meaning slow or fast, um, while others found specific gains. So, again, the, the point of bringing up this study is, is how much mixed evidence there actually could be on a, on a, on a topic like high-velocity training or just velocity training in general. Um, let's see... And also just to just to bring in another view. That's why I like to look for review articles because usually it'll take a lot of studies, like a lot of different studies with a lot of different um, evidence and and research, and they'll 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 point out all the different all the different results of those studies and just put it in a concise um, one concise article. Okay, and then the second thing I wanted to point out was um, this line right here. So training at slow velocity showed no significant gains in peak torque in any of the three velocities tested. And torque is just basically like um, a moment of force that usually leads to rotation. So um, Velocity showed no significant gains in peak torque in any of the three velocities tested that was slow, intermediate, and fast, while gains for the fast velocity were significant only at the training speed, suggesting that a great part of the gains observed with training at high speeds is due to learning. Um, and they, the, the second part that I wanted to read from this is, is kind of an interesting point because they, 
well, I'll just read it because they actually describe what they mean by why why training at the high speeds is, is due to learning and, and why the slow speeds might not have showed a significant increase. So um, it is possible that a learning effect was not observed for the slow group due to the fact that the subjects were first submitted to an adaptation period, meaning that they, they were taught how to use the equipment and actually taught like what to do for with the slow velocity or with the slow um, velocity testing. Um, so that consisted of exercise in isotonic equipment where the velocity would have been similar to that of the slow group. Uh, according to the authors, this adaptation may have overcome learning effect. Um, and they went on to say like why why else there was why else there might have only been a significant increase with their uh, significant gain in the, the fast velocity group. Okay. Yeah, so the, so I just wanted to point out in the in the actual table here the different um, the mixture of results that that there can be with it with if you look at different um, different points and in, in different sides of uh, like of a topic like velocity training so there is um, they had they had tested the slow groups and the fast groups and and what this shows is that with the slow group that there that there were there were gains in in either general which is uh, as it shows down here in nearly all velocities isokinetic um, significant specific so this just basically shows how much of a mixture there can be with um, there how much of a mixture there was with the slow group with the slow velocity group and also with the fast group there was also a mixture of velocity gain so not just specific like there wasn't just specific there wasn't just general um, there wasn't just significant there were there were there was a variation in where the actual gain was training fast velocity so that could be correlated or that could I could say that you know if you're if you're thinking that you want to train high velocity in order to jump higher that that maybe training high velocity isn't the only way to um, to train to jump higher or to or to 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 work velocity to help your vertical that's what I'm trying to say um, so yeah, so after um, that point, let me see, I wanted to go to another um, velocity, let me see here, above 1.2 neural adaptation. So hydraulic equipment does not offer a loading system with the same characteristics as isokinetic equipment. Um, the fluid offers resistance according to, so it's just another, this is just another example of, of um, the training equipment that they use. So this was hydraulic. Um, an average when the number of rep repetitions exceeds the desired value, the resistance is increased so that the, the desired velocity is maintained. So that's just basically a description of how they would actually test for velocity using um, a specific um, a specific equipment. Um, okay, so I want to go back to the chat really quick and answer any questions. So Mitchell is saying, and how um, Mitchell, do you do one thing on one day? And something different on other days, uh, Mitchell. So yeah, so usually, um, usually I'll do like training one day, or so I'll do like a, either a contrast training day or a plyometric day, or just something related to to working out, and then I'll save like dunking or uh, more more jumping related workouts for uh, a separate day. So I don't like to do those or mix those uh, mix those on the same day. Yeah, Mitchell said, "Do you like me asking loads of questions?" Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what these Q and A's are for, like for you guys to ask any questions, and um, you know, for me to be able to answer them. I just like to, I like to to make these as engaging as 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 they can be. So, yeah, ask any questions you guys want to. Okay, but there's just a few more things I wanted to point out in this in the review, um, and then and I'll answer the other questions that I had from this week. Uh, let's see. Another thing I wanted to point out, though, were the. Let's see.
There was a point in here about neural adaptation that I wanted to point out, which I was going to relate to the the. Um, if you guys saw my la the uh, a past Q and A that I did with a family friend of mine um, who is a neuroscientist, we, we talked about uh, the CNS training and what that uh, how that um, how that incorporates neural adaptation. And I, okay, here it is. Okay. Um, this is the, this is the uh, paragraph I wanted to read. So the short duration of training is yet another factor to be considered. Most studies train between. So this was just referring to one of the studies that they that they looked at and actually um, brought information from. So most studies train between four and eight weeks, except uh, Provost et al., whose aim was to verify the learning effect and only trained for ten weeks. Gains in strength obtained from short training period six to ten weeks come mostly from neural adaptation after which muscular hypertrophy plays a greater role on the gains in strength um, and power. So that neural adaptation argument um, is kind of go is going to kind of go along with the, with the learning um, that I'm going to talk about at the end of this Q&A and the thought I had about it. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm gonna re okay. Now I want to. I want to end this uh, reading. I want to end reading this study with the practical applications that they talked about, and then also the conclusions. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to read this last paragraph here of the, the practical applications. So whether resistance training at higher velocities compared with slower traditional training better enhances the improvement in functional performance. Um, well, this is talking about in, in elderly. I think there was another practical, let me see. Okay. Sorry, that was not the, the paragraph I wanted to point out. Okay, one of the, okay one of the reasons for the great for the great interest in in velocity and strength training is its application in sports performance. So like something so doing it to increase your vertical would be like an example of that. Um, it is generally believed if a sport performance requires movement of a body segment with the speed exceeding two hundred degrees per second or even five hundred degrees per second. Resistance training with a similar velocity will enhance the sport-specific outcome. So that's just saying that um, the idea is that if you train at you know if you train at at this um, at this level you know 200 degrees per second or 500 degrees per second or whatever the speed is that would be similar to that that you would perform with the with the you know vertical jump or sprint or whatever it might be that working at that or training at that velocity in your workouts or exercises would be would be better. Um, but it goes on to say four of the studies discussed in previous sections investigated the effect of um, of isokinetic or isotonic resistance training on sport specific uh, functional performance. Both found evidence supporting the fast training group on the motor performance. Um, Smith and Melton reported greater increases for the fast compared with the slow. 39% greater for standing broad jump and 10 times more for standing vertical jump and 40 yard dash. But um, Pipes and Wilburn obtained no improvements for either group on the standing long jump, but found increases in both groups on the 40-yard dash, uh, softball throw, uh, vertical vertical jump, and only in the fast group for the two-handed sitting shot put. So I thought that was when I read that I thought that was interesting because in the first in the first couple that they talked about there, um, they the, the the group that actually tested faster velocity showed an increase in vertical jump, but then in the in the second two that they talked about the um, in the group that was working with the slower velocity show, still showed improvement in in the vertical jump um, in the vertical jump category um, the effects of isokinetic training 100 degrees on standing long jump performance were investigated by Morris um, training was conducted for six weeks with previously untrained men and no significant gains were reported on standing um, should be long, long jump performance. Uh, 
the study by um, Van Odigan, maybe, trained women college volleyball players on slow, um, on slow four seconds per repetition or fast two seconds per repetition speed leg press isokinetic exercises for eight weeks. Results indicated that both groups improved vertical jump performance after training with no difference between groups. So basically what I wanted to point out with these practical applications is that is, is the mixture that this study found when um, looking at all these different studies that whether it was slow or fast that there were still improvements with vertical jumping. Um, so I wanted to go to the conclusion now. And I really wanted to read this the, the full conclusion because I thought it was a good um, a good wrap up basically of this whole topic of high velocity training. Um, okay, so some studies indicated that training with slow velocities produces general gains in strength, that is in all velocities, while others support specific gains only at slow velocities. Training at fast velocities produces gains that are general, specific, or even at velocities equal to or lower than those used for training. So that right there just kind of just is a mixture of everything saying that training at fast velocities produces gains either general, specific, or velocities equal or lower, so it's just everything combined. Um, in relation to power, results are also contra uh, contradictory, with some studies indicating that training with slow velocities produces sometimes general gains, sometimes specific, and that with fast velocities, gains are specific. Isotonic studies with training at different velocities point towards general gains for both slow and fast velocities. Velocity specificity can be seen in the sense that gains tend to be larger at training velocity even when there is a transfer to other velocities. Results from our lab showed opposite trends depending on the exercise being performed. What velocity should be recommended for resistance training is still not clear. Weak study designs and the lack of uh, conscientious or consensus lead to the need for more adequately controlled trials to clarify the influence of velocity on the gains in strength consequent to resistant training. Um, velocity specificity and resistance training to improve sport specific performance has not been well defined. There is evidence suggesting that movement pattern and neuromuscular intent are more important than movement velocity for improving sport specific task. And that's where I wanted that's probably that's where I wanted to to end talking about the studies on that that last that last line right there. There is evidence suggesting that movement pattern and neuromuscular intent are more important than movement velocity for improving sport specific tasks. So that right there you can you can you can argue that you know just performing whatever the skill is or the task itself is is more important to in order to improve than you know trying to 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 base your training off high velocity or or strength or contrast or just whatever label you want to put on your training is that performing the skill is arguably more important than um, um, doing some type of specific training. Okay, I'm going to go back now to the chat and answer the questions. Let's see. Uh, Mitchell, what is your vertical goal in inches? Uh, right now, Mitchell, my vertical goal in inches is um, 50 inches. And, I mean, that, that could be a, a moving goal, moving higher, at least when I hit 50. Uh, but that's my goal in inches right now. Uh, can I do a video analyzing someone's dunk attempt and say things they were doing wrong and how to fix it? Um, yeah, I could do that. I've never thought about thought about doing a video like that, but I could definitely I'll write that down really quick. So analyze another. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely do a video like that, though. Um, so the so the first question I wanted to answer was from uh, Jacob from J Duth Basketball. He asked me about uh, proper warm up and um, let's see. I'm just gonna bring it up. So he said how to properly warm up before dunk sessions. He's noticed that sometimes even when he even when he stretches or warms up that his legs still tend to get tight. Same with foam rolling. I'm not sure if I should um, foam roll before or after sessions. So for me when it comes to dunk sessions, I I talked about this in the last in my last dunk uh, dunk session video actually. I like to to have like a full dynamic warm up in and that you know for me that means just just 
really getting a sweat going before I actually go into the dunk session because I did one experiment video where I tried to go into the dunk session just cold and I feel I felt like I was going to injure myself if I kept going at the speed that I started with. So that one I, I ended up just, um, it took me like a half an hour before I even felt like warmed up for the dunk session. So in terms of like properly warming up, I would say to do like a glute, um, like a glute or hip core um, targeted warm up. Um, for me, like I like to do the resistance band walks or side to side leg, leg kicks um, or even like walking lunges or um, like hip hip rotation, so walking and then rotating your hip in and out. Just just doing stuff that would um, that would get your lower body warmed up, and then also focusing on your upper body. So doing like some type of um, some type of shoulder like dynamic shoulder warm up, um, like arm swings, or just just doing just doing light jumps, something to get into the movement of jumping before you actually jump. Um, and then I and then with with dunk sessions, I'll also do kind of like a. I feel like it, it almost acts like a mini plyometric warm up, and that's just by like shooting or dribbling, uh, or just just moving around even more to get more of a sweat going and get even looser before I go into a dunk session. So, those would probably be my my best recommendation for warming up before a dunk session. And then with foam rolling, I us I'll usually do foam rolling on. Um, I, I used to do it more before a workout, but I noticed that uh, it was for me. It's better to do it for me. It was better to do it after. For, um, after a workout or dunk session, you know, or even on days that it's like my active rest day, that's when I'll actually put more focus into doing like um, like foam rolling or I have a peanut. It's just two lacrosse balls taped together, doing something like that, and actually targeting uh, uh, areas that are specifically sore and just kind of resting um, in those areas and just just getting the muscle to loosen up. So that would be probably that would be when I would recommend to to use the foam roller instead of before. Maybe focus on that after or on days that you're not dunking. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation for how to properly warm up before dunk sessions and then how to use the foam roller too. And then I had another question from um, Jerry5 on Instagram. He said ways to track ways to track your progression to jump higher. So for me, the way I first started to track my my dunking or jumping progression was actually through starting an Instagram account, and um, you know after that I was just able to to actually see how I was progressing with with my Instagram. It was just for dunking, so I would actually be able to see where I was where I was at in terms of dunking, and you know I would be able to to look back at the videos and see like maybe week by week or month by month like where if I was actually progressing and how I was progressing. So even though it might be hard for you to I guess not maybe like accept it for you to see it at first if you're not jumping that high at the beginning then that just you know recording yourself jumping and and looking back and looking at it you know week by week just to see um, just look at your technique or how high you were getting maybe one week versus another that would be like the best way I think to to track your progression is just to take like many videos of yourself jumping and just really like look at look at all the aspects and all the, the little the the details of of how you were jumping or um, how high you were getting or the technique that you had maybe during a dunk session or jumping or um, whatever it might be so um, that would be one way to track your progression and then another way could just be um, like how how I've done the experiments where you actually just like write out like through the day like what you did that day uh, how, maybe if that had if that could have affected how you were uh, how you were jumping that day or or dunking. So maybe just just writing out how you were feeling or or what went on like the day before the day of something like that. Um, but yeah, those would be those would be a couple ways that you could track your progression in terms of uh, jumping. Or I mean, even 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 set a goal like um, for me like for me it's getting to fifty inches. So um, for me, it's just finding it's finding different things that are higher than what I can reach now and setting that as the goal to touch and then just seeing how close I get to it. Uh, week by week and, and making that like a marker for me to get to. So setting a marker to touch or, or to, to touch on the backboard or the rim or whatever um, whatever you know your goal would be is just to set that as the goal and then once you get that just move it up from there. Yeah so that those would be my suggestions for um, for dunking uh, for tracking dunk progress and then 
I had another suggestion about body fat percentage and its effect on vertical jump, but I think I'm going to save that suggestion for another Q&A and actually look more into that topic, um, like look into studies and stuff and do more research into how that might affect vertical jump. <clears throat> Martin said he liked the idea of looking at another video and then actually talking through it. So I'm going to look and see if there are other um, what other questions I had from the week. Oh, Jeffrey Jack, he said, um, can I get some core exercises? I think it's holding me back from dunking. So I'm just going to throw out a few core exercises that I like to do. Um, I like to, If you have access to a TRX band, I really like those for core exercises. Or just doing planks, side planks. Um, if you have um, like an exercise ball, like using that to do rollouts. Or um, even doing like single leg, plank, like single leg planks, like one leg in the air. Um, and then switching. Just... Uh, just core work that activates your your whole core. I know that might sound like repetitive, but it activates your whole core rather than just doing like um, like crunches or or something that that you that might miss you know half your core or your or your obliques or something like that. So just with core exercises, just things that really um, they really incorporate your entire core. That's why I really like to use the TRX band because it. Um, it forces me to, to use my whole core rather than just, you know, doing like crunches or something like that. Or even medicine ball throws. Um, I can go more into depth with that in a, in a workout video. Okay, so I think that's pretty much um, all the questions that I wanted to go through on here. I'm going to do one more check really quick. Oh, I had another one from... Um, uh, I'm just Justin on Instagram. He asked me what the ideal weight was, which I'll get into that uh, with the next Q and A when I actually go when I actually do more research into um, the other the other suggestion I had, which was uh, the best body fat percentage for for dunking. So once I look into that, when I'll I'll answer that other question too on the ideal weight. But basically, I feel like the ideal weight kind of depends on where you're at with your strength. So if you're you know if you're stronger. Then maybe you can you can have a few extra pounds than somebody who's maybe not as strong but at the same height as as you are. So I feel like that just that um, plays a role too. Okay, so what I wanted to end with was this last part is, that you guys see in the title, and that is learning how to dunk. So um, this was just like a thought I had, and I was I've been going back and forth on whether I even wanted to bring this up or not. Because, I don't know, it was just like a random thought and I wasn't sure um, if I wanted to bring it up. Yeah, so, but I just decided I'm going to bring it up and talk about it. So, okay. So, right after, and I wrote this all out because I just want, I didn't want to forget it. So, right after doing the research for this q and I, I basically had this, this, I had this whole thought like in the shower after doing the research for this Q&A. And it had to do with learning. And that's why I said to remember that point in the study that I pointed out about learning and how um, how they said that how the learning effect might have played a role in why the high velocity worked better than the other velocities tested. So um, it's going to be like a little story. So uh, basically, I start. So I start off with think about a simple example of something you've had to learn, like like walking, for example. So what experiences what experiences took place before that before that goal of walking was ever achieved? 
probably learning to, to move your limbs and then you slowly started to crawl and then you made attempts at standing and then maybe somebody helped you stand and then you fell over a bunch of times and then finally one day you adapted enough to where you can actually stand and, and start walking. So that was kind of like the first little, the little example I wanted, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring up. And then the second part was that I was like relating that to, to jumping and, and dunking and I thought... Um, you know, I thought like I would I would argue that that dunking or jumping can be looked at in a similar way, maybe not maybe not as primitive as like walking or standing up is, but but it's a skill um, it's a skill that is learned which requires a buildup of experiences that have to take place beforehand. So before it can, before that goal of walking is ever achieved, there has to be a bunch of experiences that has to happen before you actually stand up and start walking. So. For example, maybe maybe with dunking or jumping, it starts off as as a thought or like an imagination, or um, and then from there, maybe you start to watch videos of other people doing it. Then you imagine yourself doing it, and then you start to you start to build on those thoughts and those imaginations by maybe jumping outside on a low rim, or just you know maybe attempting to to touch something that that you can't reach, or just something like or you see someone do it, and then you try to jump, and then um, and then you get a start. Uh, you start off by doing that, and then. Maybe after that you start to work out more, or maybe you change your diet to lose excess weight, um, etc. So my point is, is that it's almost as though in order to to learn to dunk, there is almost a natural course of experiences that begin to take place, and when when it happens, like when when you actually dunk or when you reach a certain point with jumping or whatever whatever skill you're developing, it's as though it had already happened, and it feels like it was just like by magic that. Um, that you that you all of a sudden dunked or you all of a sudden touched touched this point with jumping or, or reached a goal that you wanted to get to with a certain skill. So I'm gonna continue. Um, but in order for that to happen, there were again, yeah, there were all those experiences that took place beforehand, the learning part, um, before it actually happened. So to go beyond that, um, people have asked me about like plateaus and they say like how do I get out of a plateau or like I've hit a, I mean myself, I've hit a I've hit plateaus and I've just like thought, you know, how can I get through this? Um, so with that, I argue that a plateau is a sign that that learning, in this case, to to further develop a skill like dunking or jumping, isn't isn't taking place as much, and maybe um, as maybe it was in the beginning, like when you first started, just you know, you you would jump all the time, you would you would imagine it, you would um, constantly imagine it or think about it or watch videos on it. Um, um, so yeah, so that the task maybe like dunking um, or the task maybe dunking the same way or working out with the same routine maybe that has become so repetitive that there's no longer anything to adapt to um, and in a way maybe it's maybe it's like you've kind of maybe it's like you've reached a point where it's like autopilot because that's um, because that's how that's how easy it is for your body to just to do the motion so what I wanted to end this Q&A with was if you want to go beyond the limits of what you can do now, whether it's with, with dunking or jumping or with any skill or learning or whatever, that you have to learn what you can't do right now in order to, to reach that goal of what you want to do. So, yeah, that was just basically a long, a long afterthought I had after doing the, this, this research for this Q&A. So that's where I want to end this Q&A. I want to thank you guys for, for watching this live stream. Stay tuned for more videos to come, and I will see you guys later.